can't hear you. Damn, okay. Forgot to unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> uh, I hope that's going to be the biggest problem for today. Um, hi and welcome. I hope you can hear me now. At least now I know that the stream chat is working properly. Perfect. <laughs> hi and welcome uh, to Introduction to Git, uh, part one. Um, very, very cool that already that many have joined um, under these very, very strange circumstances. Um, today's topic is all about um, basics, how you're going to work with Git on your local machine, especially with your local repository. Uh, and we're going to, um, I guess that some of you are going to be quite familiar with Git already. So you can, we have to view this today as a sort of um, getting everyone to the same page, but I hope that I can um, make this still interesting for you because we're going to take a bit of a, a dive into what Git is doing internally when you're committing and so on and so forth. Um, I would have really preferred to do this um, in lecture, in a lecture hall, because I guess that some of you are going to have questions and the interaction would be very, very cool in such a lecture, but I guess that's not possible. Um, so uh, I very, very recommend you to use the stream chat whenever you have a question. Um, if I ignore your question, um, feel free to just email me um, stefan.pranger at student.theograz.at and I'm going to answer your question after the stream ends. Um, the stream will take about an hour. Um, depends on how many questions you are, have and uh, how, we, how long it's going to take me to do the practical parts. Okay. Um, so let me give you a quick overview about what we're going to do today. So as I already mentioned, um, everything today is going to be about the basics. Um, we're going to only talk about local repositories, um, but beforehand, I want to give you an introduction. So what is, actually, what is Git actually? What are version control systems? Why are we using Git and not something else? Um, where are you using, going to use Git? especially at university, but what are some other use cases for Git? Um, the stream is being recorded, yes. As far as I know, YouTube just leaves them as they're at the very same link. So you can just go to that, uh, to the link that you're currently on, that you currently watch the stream and, and replay it. And the stream will also be copied over to the TU Graz iMOOCs channel so that you can watch it there as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> after after uh, a short introduction, I want to introduce you to the basic commands. So we're going to take a look at how you tell Git to track um, your files, how you can add changes to the staging area, how you can commit them, how you can view your history, and so on and so forth. And what we're going to also do is take a look at how you can undo things, how you can move files around, how you um, undo commits, how you change and edit commits, and so on and so forth. And on the very last slide, um, I've provided you some questions, which are kind of a recap for today's topics, so that you can go through them uh, and answer them on your own. Okay, so what is Git? Um, Git is a distributed version control system uh, for source code development and other things actually. And its goals include uh, speed, data integrity, and the possibility for a nonlinear distributed workflow. So Wikipedia, Wikipedia throws uh, a few buzzwords at us, and I'm going to try to summarize them uh, quickly. So Git is a version control system. Um, that means Git is going to track changes that you make to certain files, to certain source code files, for example. And as soon as you tell Git to make an entry in its history with certain changes to certain files, it's going to capture a snapshot of that version and going to it's going to store them 
in the history of your repository. And in contrast to, decentra uh, to, sorry, to centralized version control systems, Git is a distributed version control system. So you, as you're working, as you're recording your history of your project, and you're going to some, some sometimes, uh, someday, um, push that to a server or share it with a fellow project member, team member, uh, whatever, Git is not going to only push or share the final version of your project, but it's going to distribute the whole history. <clears throat> so you have to keep that in mind uh, when working with Git. Um, its goals include uh, speed and data integrity. I think these are quite obvious. We want, to, we want uh, that software to be fast and we don't want it to corrupt the data. Um, so if you, for example, want to look at things that you've done one year ago, two years ago, two years ago, whatever, you want these things uh, to be in the same state as they were uh, a year ago. The key thing um, which makes Git outstanding and what, um, why Git is um, the thing that we use in it for educational purposes, and as far as I'm aware, for most of uh, the open source projects that are out there, is the possibility to have distributed nonlinear workflows. So that is what some other distributed version control systems like CVS, Bitkeeper, Mercurial or whatever um, did not manage as good as Git is, it's do, as Git is doing. So we're going to, um, we're going to take a look at that nonlinear workflow tomorrow. Um, but so, um, so far I can tell you that this is the key, fe key feature of Git which made it so popular allowing you to simultaneously work on different versions of code and make and git makes it very very easy to merge these things together so that you can have one final version of your source code in the end and uh, one note here um, git is not github and git is not gitlab so at university you're most of the time going to work with gitlab but gitlab is just an sort of an overlay or wrapping over git it's, going, it's, it's using Git in the background, it's utilizing all the functions that Git gives us, but it gives us a whole bunch of more, more like merge requests, an issue tracker, and so far and so forth. But we're not going to cover that. We're just going to look, take a look at what Git has to offer. Okay, so what are we using Git for? Um, most of the time, you're going to use Git for your software projects, especially when you're working in teams. So Git makes it very, very easy to share your code with other team members. But, for example, I myself, whenever I start a project on my own, where I'm, at least at the very beginning, just working on my own, even then I'm initializing a Git repository. I'm initializing my project as a Git repository. Why is that? Because I tend to forget what I've worked on like a month ago very, very easily. So I want to keep a tidy history. I want to track all of the things that I've changed. So I use Git for that. And I highly encourage you to do that, to do that on your own as well, because at the very beginning, it's a nice thing to have some kind of silly project that you're working on and initialize it with a, as a Git repository as well, so that you can play around with um, with the with the subcommands that Git gives us. Um, I'm not going to like teach you how to use Git. I'm just going to show you all of the capabilities and things that it offers you, and in the end, you're going to have to learn it by doing. Um, some other things um, that Git is very useful for is especially in the case, like we've mentioned, with GitHub and GitLab, it makes it very, very easy to share your projects with the public. That's what open source is about. Um, if you have your project initialized as a Git repository, you can just push it to one of these service providers with like GitHub, for example, and people can then just clone all of your code and build it for themselves and use your source code but it obviously keeps track of the work on your project. And with that, it is very, very helpful in tracing and tracing 
down box. And since you're going to have a version of, um, of a, a working version, when as soon as you've found the place where your bug has been introduced, it's going to be more easier to find, um, find out why that bug actually has been introduced. But apart from that, um, Git does not uh, restrict it, restrict you to use it for source code management only. So when you're going to write your bachelor thesis, for example, and you split your bachelor thesis into different um, chapters, Git is completely fine with tracking changes that you do to the um, different chapters. But it can also track changes that you do to configuration files or even to your passwords. If you use it with the command line utility pass, for example, pass uh, has a wrapper for Git so that you can um, manage your encrypted passwords via Git and share them to other laptops, for example. <clears throat> so when are you going to use Git? Um, as far as I know, uh, students of biomedical engineering are already using it since you are using um, Git in the very first semester, but you are going to use it in almost every programming practical, independent of whether it's a programming practical where you're working on your own or working in a team. So it's very, very handy to get used to use Git. But as these lectures and practicals are going to be on different institutes, um, held by different lecturers, you're going to have to deal with different platforms and different hand-in requirements. So it's very, very good to get used to know Git so that you don't really have to think about what they want from you. So you just do it because you're already familiar with Git. Once you have finished with, um, with university and you start working as a computer scientist or software developer, it's the possibility of you having to use Git is very, very high. So why would you want to attend this course or listen to this stream? Um, you're going to get to understand the background. So we're going to um, test out some of the Git subcommands. Um, we're going to take a look at the so-called porcelain commands, but we're also going to take a look at what the so-called plumbing commands are very briefly. Um, and I hope in the end, this is going to give you enough preparation so that it's going to save you lots and lots of saved, uh, lots of lots of hours uh, so that you don't have to scream at your laptop or especially Git because it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Okay, as a roadmap, um, as I already said, for those who are already quite familiar with Git, I hope that this is going to be interesting as well today for you. But we are just going to cover the basics today. But tomorrow, we're going to take a look at what branches are, what remotes are, what's the difference between these two, and how do you use them to facilitate the nonlinear workflow. And the day after tomorrow, we're going to take a look at some other nice handy tools that Git provides us, like tagging, what is the ref log, how can we fiddle with the Git config to make Git look a bit prettier, or to automate some stuff hooks, and so on and so forth. Okay. So as I've already said, Git is a distributed system. So you can view Git um, kind of like Dropbox. It's a very crude um, comparison, but it works in a way like some of your cloud provider. You can store some files, push them to a server, and the, Git, uh, and the team member can then get these changes and look at them. But it's working very, very diff differently in the background. So as I'm not using a cloud service, but as far as I'm aware, Dropbox is only going to save the very last version of your file. So if you like update a Word document, for example, and you push it to Dropbox. Dropbox is just going to overwrite it if it's the same name, of course. Uh, and if you want to like have a version, an older version of your Word document, you're going to have to pre-append 
um, like version 2 or final, 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 really final, and so on and so forth. And with Git, you don't have to do that because it's keeping your history. That's what it's all about. Okay, so today we're going to take a look at the local part of that uh, whole distribution system. We're just going to take a look at how you work with your local repository because almost all of your work happens here. So you're going to um, incorporate Git into your normal workflow. You have to, you're going to incorporate it with writing your source code. So Git is just an overlay for that. And only when you're done with some changes, only when you're happy with what you've done, we are happy with the feature that you've implemented, only then you're going to push it to another server. So that's where we're going to focus on your local repository today. And the local repository is also that thing that stores your history, that tracks the changes, and so on and so forth. And it is, for our intents and purposes, divided into four stages. Okay. Um, your repository on your machine, or in one folder of, or on your machine, uh, can be identified by the .git folder. This is uh, technically not 100% correct, but I guess it suffices to say, as soon as you're working on some source code and you see that there's a .git folder, a hidden git folder within that folder, you know that version control is turned on, so to say, for that folder. How do you initialize such a git repository? Um, initializing it on your machine can be done by going into a directory and calling git init within that directory, or you just simply direct call git init with your uh, preferred directory name. So git will create that directory and initialize itself there. But most of the time, for university at least, you're going to be provided with some sort of framework. And you get that framework with git clone and the URL that you're provided with. And for a more in-depth look into into that .git file, uh, git folder. Um, we can take a look at this slide here. Um, this is what your repository looks inside. And there are a few interesting things here. The config file is, is interesting. Um, you can directly change some things in that config file if you're confident with that. But the other things that are quite interesting for us is the head file. We're going to take a look at that. And the objects and the refs folder because these basically store what we want Git to keep track of. Okay, so I've talked about stages. Um, Git uh, puts every file within your source code directory into one of these four stages. So a file can either be untracked. That means that Git has not yet um, seen this file or has it within one of its commits. Then it can be modified. That means that you have introduced some changes to the file and have not yet committed them. Then some changes can be staged. Staged means that they have been prepared for a commit or they can be committed. And that means if they're committed, Git is perfectly fine with that version of the file. It knows everything. It knows the complete history of that file. And there's nothing that you need to tell Git. with respect to changes to these files. And while you're working on your source code, you're moving files between these stages. And whenever you move a file or move a set of files from staged to committed, that means that you're creating a commit. So what is a commit exactly? As I said, it's one entry in the history of your project. It saves, a commit is always associated with a directory or a set of files that you have had changed at the very moment that you called git commit. But it's also a messaging interface for you and your team. Because a git commit consists of an author and a committer. And for the sake of this course, we're just going to treat them as the same. A message, which just like an email, consists of a subject and a body, a date 
and all of the committed files and folders. And git is as soon as you're calling git commit, git is then taking all of these information, all of that information, and the length of that information, and it's going to compute these strange sets of uh, numbers and characters. It's called a hash. So each and every commit is associated to a 40 character long hash, which is a direct reference to that exact commit. And we're going to talk about that uh, a lot, actually. So in the process of moving files from stage to commit, that is called committing. <clears throat> so internally, and I have that slide um, for you because if you're going to take a look into some manual pages, you're going to stumble uh, upon, uh, over these um, of, over this terminology here. Um, so internally, Git does not really keep. Uh, can you explain what exactly the advantages of these stages are again? Do, does one use this to keep files from being pushed to master branch until you want them to be pushed? Um, yes. So the second question can be answered with a yes. So the, um, the advantages of these stages are, um, okay, advantages or what, but the advantages of using these are, it's like, these stages are the bread and butter of Git. Without these stages, Git does not know how to handle your files. So um, with the index, like we have it here, the staging area is internally called the index. Um, that makes it like, maybe let me use that in order to, to answer that question. Um, you'd need to tell Git what files you want to make a version of. So what files and what changes to that certain files you want to make an entry in your history of. And that is what we use these uh, stages for. So Git, Git is going to compare. You, you have this head file. The head file, as we have it on the slide here, will point to your last commit. So the head file is always what Git sees as the most recent version in your project's history. And with that head and comparison to the current actual state of files, Git can tell whether these are modified or not. So that is one benefit that Git gives us. If you're working on a huge project and you have worked, I don't know, for one, two, three days or whatever, could be that you've forgotten about some change, some minor change, one line code change, in this and that header file, Git is definitely going to tell you that that file has been modified because it knows of the last version that has been uh, committed. And in comparison to that version, there's a one line change. And the staged area, sometimes you work on a feature or you're working on a bug fix um, or something similar, um, which semantically uh, or like all of the changes don't really semantically fit into one um, one commit. So that is that's what the staging area is for. But we're going to see that in detail as soon as we're going to switch over to a terminal. And we're going to type in uh, and actually test out Git. But the staging area helps you with sorting and putting together changes that belong together in, in a commit. I hope that that answers your question, but I've actually covered some stuff that I, that I wanted to cover later, but um, we're going to come back to that anyway. So um, let me summarize um, what we need to know from that uh, slide here. So Git um, does not really keep track of these chain uh, stages, it, but it rather um, keeps track of your work tree. This is like, this is your working tree what it's also called, this is your sandbox. This is what you're working on. This is what you're changing when you're introducing new files and so on and so forth. This is your working tree or work tree. And the staging area is also called the index. 
and in the manual pages it's often called the staging area or the index that is for legacy reasons and in the source code it's still called index and as i've already said head will always hold the reference to your currently last commit or the most recent commit okay um let's take a look at some of these um basic commands that you're going to use um first of all you're going to need to introduce some changes so you're either going to copy files over into your repository or you're creating them or maybe your um your ide is creating them for you because you started a project and your ide has already done all of that um git initializing and so on and so forth and as soon as you have some effort done like you have something that you're happy with you're going to want to stage files that you can do with git add git add with a file or a directory is going to just simply add and move all your files from the modified stage uh, from the modif from modified or untracked to the index to the staging area and i've listed three different um, commands that you can use so you can just simply git add this is going to add all of the changes of that particular file or directory to the staging area git add minus u is just going to move things from the modified area to the staged area this is especially helpful if you like have a, a log folder or some things that you don't want git to know about and you know okay i've changed the line here i've changed the line here I just want to commit that and you can use git add dash u but in contrast if you have done lots and lots of work lots of different things on similar files or uh, on on on, uh, on same files um, then git also gives you the possibility to almost add line by line changes to the staging area and that is what you use git add dash p for we're going to see that in action then too. Okay, so now we're now at the state where we have done some action, we've done some work, sorry, on the project, um, and we've moved some stuff from uh, modified or untracked to the staging area. <clears throat> Does staged mean that the files are essentially ready to be pushed? Um, okay, if you've asked, um, um, Two questions already about pushing to master branch. Um, we have to um, take, maybe take a step back and um, talk about what pushing means. Pushing, or at least in the context of Git, Git push always needs to talk about the remote, so some other server that you connected with. Um, we're currently not talking about pushing. Um, so let me clarify that maybe um you're not what you're doing with the things that you have in your staging area is that you are committing them to the master branch um oh, it's completely fine that's what the course is for um and it's actually not self-explanatory <laughs> git is like um yeah maybe a quick side note here um git does work perfectly internally it's very quick and, and and everything's fine with it internally but the guy who wrote git needed some other people who were better at writing user interfaces let's put it that way to restructure all of the interface that you have with git so if you have problems with git or you don't understand what certain um sub commands are doing that's perfectly fine that has some uh, issues with the legacy of git and how it evolved um, but um, let me get back to your question um, the files that are in the staged area are ready to be committed not to be pushed what pushing means is that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow um, so files from the staged area are committed to your local branch but not to some other branch on the server I hope that's that makes makes that clarifies that. <clears throat> so um, 
Okay, we're back at um, the state where we have added some files to the staging area. So we have made some work. We have, I don't know, introduced a new function which does something, this and that. And we're fine with how that function is implemented. So we git add the file where we have added that function. And then that file is going to be in our staging area. And then you might want to check the changes. You can call git diff dash dash change. Git will then tell you what changes you've introduced. That's kind of for you to have to check before you're committing. Um, if you're fine with all of that, you call git commit or git commit dash m with a commit message. But I would um, highly suggest you to use git commit because git commit is going to open up an editor for you, like your favorite editor. And git commit will tell you, okay, you've added this file, you have changed that file, you have deleted that file within your commit. Please provide me with a git um, with a commit message, with a subject and a body, and then I'm going to commit that for you. So I would recommend you to use git commit. Mainly because of the benefits um, that your editor is giving you. Okay. Um, since you're going to do a, a, a lot of working on source code, like you're, the main work that you're doing, obviously, um, you won't memorize where you have put certain files in which stage. That is what git status is for. Plain and simple, git status tells you which files are new, which files are modified, which files are staged, or which files are deleted. Plain, plain and simple. Um, Whereas git status tells you the status in which, in, 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 in which your um, repository currently is, git log gives you the history of your current branch. So if we're going to um, do some work uh, on our repository, we can take a look at um, all of the things that we have done in, done in the past with git log. And I actually want to change over to a terminal now and we can take a look at uh, all of the things that we have done so far, uh, what we've covered so far. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to initialize uh, an empty Git repository. Uh, let's call it lecture one. Git has now created a directory for me, lecture one. And if we call ls with the dash a option, we can see that that folder is empty apart from that git, repos uh, git uh, folder. So let's take a look at that git folder. And you can see here all of these um, um, directories and files are in there. Um, and there are also some sample hooks, which I've omitted on my slide, but that's basically what our git repository looks on the inside. Okay, so now to start, um, we need some dummy file. So I'm going to quickly create a file with some function and some source code. Um, our dummy file is going to print an app name. So std cout dummy app. And it's going to have a main function, which is going to return zero. We save and quit that. And we take a look at our git status. And git status tells us that we're on branch master. We have one untracked file, namely dummy.cpp. And in that verbose uh, version of git status, git status basically takes us by the hand and tells us, okay, do you want to commit that file? So just call git add dummy.cpp and you have now included it into your, to the staging area for your next, next commit. So let's take another look at git status. Git status tells us, okay, there's a new file, changes to be committed, dummy.cpp. Perfect. We're now going to go git commit. And as I've mentioned before, 
if you omit the dash M option, it's going to open up my, my editor, which is Vim in my case. And it tells me you're on branch master. That's quite a handy information. It's the initial commit. That's not going to be there after we've committed now. And it tells me which changes are committed. So dummy.cpp. And we're going to give it an, uh, a descriptive commit message in it first source code file. Save and quit that. And as soon as you quit out and you have an, a, a, a commit message in the editor, um, Git will commit that. If you, if you think that there's something wrong with what you're committing, just simply omit the message and save and quit. It will tell, tell you cannot commit with an empty commit message. Um, but we did provide Git an, uh, a commit message. So it tells me master, we're at root commit, and that's the init, for, init first source code file. And it also tells me some, some status. One file changed, 11 insertions, so we add 11 lines in our file. Okay. <clears throat> but before we do, uh, before we test out any of the other subcommands, I actually want to give you um, a quick look into, we want to quickly peek into what internally just happened. Um, I don't really think that you need to memorize that, but I think it's going to give you, a, 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 how do I put it? It's going to give you an idea of what Git is doing in the background so that you can better understand all of the workings, like why is Git, or why, is the result, why does the result in the end look like, um, like it does? And I guess that's, it's, it's helpful to know how uh, the software internally works. And for that, we're going to issue these plumbing commands that I've talked of, um, that I've mentioned already. So one of that is git ls files. And as the ls command, um, git ls files is going to tell me which files git knows about. So which files are either modified or committed. We can see perfectly fine. That's dummy CPP, the only file that we've added so far. But internally, there are some others, there's, there are a whole bunch of other objects within our Git repository. So if we take a look at our objects folder, we can see that apart from the info and the pack folder, there's also a folder called 1841 and bb. Okay. And if we take a look into, into that, we can see that there are some other files in there. Let's actually take a look at what these files are. We can see that is sadlib compressed data. So Git has taken some data and it has compressed it just like a zip file. So basically Git has, while we were committing, um, created three different zipped files for us. <coughs> and if we can now um, take a look at Git log, we can see that um, our hash has been computed. It's 40 characters long, and it starts with BB, 6, E, O, 8, and so on and so forth. And if we take a look at what our object folder, object folder holds, it has a folder called BB, and all of the other characters here match up with our commit. So we can already deduce that that file holds our commit or information about our commit. And in order to take a look at these files, we can issue git cat file. And I want to take a look at all of these files. So I'm going to list them out. And we can see here that that three compressed files here um, have are, are is, that is actually a commit, a tree, and a blob. And the interesting thing here is what that blob is, because an internally, a blob to git is what we call a file. So we can now take a look at that. And with the p option, it's going to pretty print it. 
and it should suffice to give it the first four characters. And we can see here, okay, within that compressed um, file, we have our dummy.cpp. Um, so once again, you don't really need to memorize that. Just keep in mind that somewhere within that object folder, Git is holding a copy, a raw copy of our file. Okay, so let's test out the other subcommands. Um, so let's open up our dummy CPP file. And let's say we have some issues with our coding standard. We don't want to allow uh, empty lines in there. So we remove them. I can write and quit out and take another look at git status. Git status now tells me that dummy has somehow diverged from the version that git knows about, so it's modified. And in order to add that, we're going to call git add dummy.cpp. Could also just call git add dash u. Now let's take another look at git status and git tells me that that file has been staged. So now finish that. Um, fixes according to coding standard. Save and quit that. And now we can see that our log holds two entries, two commits. And now, now that we have two commits, I want to take a look at what our object folder holds. So now we can see that there are two blobs, there are two trees and two commits. So I can, I guess that you can already deduce, okay, the two commits are the two commits that we have. The two trees belong to these two commits, but the two blobs, what's that about? We've already taken a look at the BF68. Let's take another look in there. Git file minus, minus P, BF68. <coughs> Okay, sorry, no, we had a look at the other one. <laughs> Let's see, that's the corrected version. Okay, so we can see Git has stored um, the updated version where we have fixed our coding issues. And if we now take a look at the other blob, 18BD, we can see that that blob is actually the old version. So what's the main takeaway for you here? Git is not really storing the changes, because then um, the cat file that we have done here would have shown us the changes that we've introduced. But it's not actually only storing the changes, Git will actually store the whole file. And that's quite interesting for us because we know now that Git is storing every version separately. So that makes it really, really easy for us if we have introduced some bugs, um, some stuff that we want to revert. It's very easy because all of the old versions are still there. You're obviously not going to do that via cat file. It's quite an unhandy way to do that. But what I wanted to show you um, with that was that Git really stores all of the versions separately. Okay. Uh, what I've mentioned in, in when adding files, was that you can actually um, edit, uh, add files to the staging area line by line. So I want to test that out as well. So first thing is that we might want to have our main return a one, as long as our app is not finished. So we want to exit with an error code, as long as we're not done. And maybe our app name should be followed by an end line whenever <coughs> we print it out. So we can save and quit that and take a look at git status again. Okay, our dummy file is modified. Um, but I now have introduced two changes to the same file, which semantically don't really fit together. So there are two different things happening at the same time to that file. Um, so good practice would be here to describe these things in two different commits. I mean, you can just add that, commit it and right into the commit message, I have 
added a new line, I have changed the error, uh, exit code completely fine. But to have a cleaner history and separate these changes, um, we do want to make separate commits for that. We're going to see later uh, and tomorrow actually that if you just want to have a certain change, you can quickly get it from another branch. So we want stuff that belongs to different, uh, that describes different things. We want to have those things in different commits. So we're going to call git add dash p. That was the uh, option where I said that you can basically um, add line per line changes to the staging area. But we can see, we are going to see what it actually means. So it's not going to let you add um, the changes line by line, but Git is actually trying to, <clears throat> to filter out things that belong to each other. And things that belong to each other in terms of Git are called hunks. So Git is already asking me, do you want to stage this hunk? I'm going to give it the um, question mark so that we can get it a uh, nice description of what all of these different characters mean here. So if I give it a Y, Git will just stage that hunk. But as I've already said, I think that those two things don't really belong into one commit. So I want, to, I want Git to split the current hunk into smaller hunks. So I'm going to give it the S option. Now Git, is only showing me the first hunk, that one here. So Git has now split up the end line edi uh, addition and the exit code change into different hunks. And I actually don't want to stage that, but I want to stage the return one. Now we can take another look at Git status. And now our file is both modified and staged and only modified. So what we have achieved is we have only added one part of the file or one change of the file to the staging area. So how can we <clears throat> take a look at what, what um, went up where? For that, we can use git diff. So git diff dash dash staged uh, is a nice little tool if you want to if you want to be sure before you're committing that you don't have to fiddle around with the commit afterwards because you've made a mistake, you can use git diff dash dash staged because that is going to show you all of the changes that are currently prepared for your next commit. And in our case, this is the change of return zero to return one. So git diff tells me, okay, you have erased the line return zero and you have replaced it with return one. We can quit out of that. And now git commit. And we're going to give it um, a descriptive commit message, changed main exit code to error code. And we're actually going to add a subject as a description. Um, we, are, we are going to keep this that way as long as we do not have a final version 1.0. So everyone with everyone that is going to read my history knows why I have changed that error code. Going to save and quit. And all of the things that I have had not staged so far are still uh, labeled as modified. We can look at that with just git diff without the staged option. And we can see that that change is still there, still in the modified area. We're going to add that and commit it. And we'll say that printing app name should also print new line. Save and quit. And now, oops. Um, we have committed all of our changes. Git tells us that there is nothing to commit. Our working tree is clean. So what we've achieved is that everything, everything that is 
uh, within our project um, Git knows about, so all of the changes are being tracked. And our working tree is clean. Okay, so let me stop here for a minute. And take a look at the stream because apparently my YouTube studio is telling me that there are some issues with the stream. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to quickly investigate that. Okay, apparently it's just the studio which is not updating, but I hope that the stream is fine so far. Okay, so um, so far we have covered um, what you need to move a new file that you have newly created or newly copied into your project um, and went all the way from having a new file to commit it. We've also covered how you make changes to the file and commit parts of these changes separately in different commits. <clears throat> but no one's perfect. Um, everyone's making a mistake every once in a while. So we're now going to take a look at uh, how you can fix mistakes or how you can prevent such mistakes. Okay, but before we're going to take a look at that, um, I think that we need to make the git log a bit prettier. Um, as I've as I have it here on the slide, I think Git is all about versioning and information. Um, so I often take a look at the Git log because as I've already said, I tend to forget what I've done so far, or I maybe need to look at what some other people are doing or what they have done so far in order to get a better understanding about what's happening in the project. And to be honest, we have, how many commits do we have so far? Four. And I mean, I've, increase the font size uh, a fair bit in order to make it readable on, the, on YouTube. But as you can see, four commits and my whole screen is already full. So there are ways to make that uh, a bit prettier. And <clears throat> uh, the first thing would be to just give git log the dash dash one line option. And that is going to tidy up everything, give you the crucial information and put every commit into one line, hence the dash dash one line option. Um, the git log dash dash graph option we're going to need as soon as we're going to talk about branches because everything is going to need, uh, everything is going to diverge into different branches. And for that, we can use the um, graph option. And we can also combine these. But if you go really into depth, then we're going to do that in the uh, third instance of this course, you can even just give Git with the pretty format option. You can just give it some placeholders, give it color codes and so on and so forth to make things really pretty. And I think it's not about, it's not about the beauty of how your terminal looks like. I think it's, uh, it gives you a better way of understanding things if you can see everything uh, in, with one quick look. So this is how I currently uh, look at at the log. Um, so I want uh, I want everything to be short. I want to have the commit messages on one line. I actually don't really want to calculate when these things happen. I want to have a relative date. So it tells me that okay, 19 minutes ago apparently we have started working on that, and four minutes ago I have um, introduced the last commit. This version also um, splits up the author and the committer, but as we can see here, they're both the same. Like we said, um, we're going to treat them as the same <clears throat> in the, in, for the sake of this course. Okay, and how you can actually do that, we're going to cover in, 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 uh, on the day after tomorrow. Okay, so how do you undo things? Um, Another takeaway from what I've shown you with the cat file option was that Git generally adds data and information. 
So that means whenever you commit something, Git is in the, on the very least creating these three files, a commit, a tree for that commit, and at least that one file that you have committed. <clears throat> as soon as your project is going to get more involved and there are more and more things that you commit, all of this is going to grow bigger, bigger and bigger. But Git is never going to actively erase any of these things. So Git generally only adds state and information. But it's possible to undo a commit, amend a commit because you have a typo in the commit message or you forgot to add something to the commit. You can even go as far as change the whole history of your project. But that's not a very good thing. We're going to cover that too. But keep in mind that you're sharing your whole history with other people. So if you change your history in your local computer and you want to push it somewhere to a server, for example, to a remote server, Git is going to tell you, okay, no, sorry, your the histories are not the same. I can't really fit things together. So um, be cautious with that. Um, and since you can edit things, edit commits, you can obviously also completely drop changes that you've introduced. Okay. <clears throat> but before we're going to take a look at how to erase everything that we have worked on, we're going to um, start a bit smaller. We're going to take a look at what the git restore command is for. Um, so far, all of the arrows have pointed into which this direction. Um, <clears throat> because we have only moved things from the untracked or the modified area into the staging area and we have committed. But sometimes you're going to add things to the staging area. What do you could be that you need to add some additional things or you're unsure whether that fits together. So you want to restore these things. Um, that is what git restore is for. Um, git restore with the dash dash staged option is just going to grab that file that you give it and remove it from the staging area. So it's basically putting it back into the modified area. If you give um, git restore the dash dash staged option and the dash dash work tree option, git restore is going to undo the staging. So it's moving it back to the work tree and it's going to undo the work tree. And that means that it's basically undoing the work that you've done. So whenever you have not committed yet, and if we're talking about the situation that we're currently talking about, um, we are before committing and you call git restore with the dash dash work tree option, you're actively erasing changes. So that is where you have to be cautious. Everything that is, has been committed once is fine. Git knows about it somewhere. You just have to find it and there are ways to find it. But if you work on something and then you think, ah, oh, dang it, it's complete bullshit, pardon my French, and you want to remove it, you call git restore with the dash dash work tree <clears throat> uh, option. Uh, and for all those who have already worked with git, this is a new thing. Um, you used to um, either use git reset for that or git checkout. And I think git restore is way more descriptive for that. Okay, so let's see that in action. We're going to change our dummy CPP file once more. And we're going to introduce a very, very small integer function, which is going to return minus zero. We save and quit. We git add the dummy file and take a look at git diff that dash dash staged. And we can see, okay, who, well, for some reason that doesn't really matter now, we want to not stage this and fix that. Um, for that, we're going to call git re, or let's actually call git status beforehand. We can see that dummy has been added to the staging area and git actually tells me what to do. It tells me git restore dash dash staged to unstage. So git, git restore dash dash staged, or if you're lazy, you can just give it um, dash s, capital S option. 
and then git status will be in our dummy area again. So what would have happened if we were to add it and then make some changes and maybe say that that's actually a very large integer, save and quit. So here we can see these, um, um, the stages uh, in action again. So I um, have added the function. I have then added the file to the staging area where it currently is. And after adding it to the staging area, I have also modified it again. So we can take a look at the staged version. <clears throat> so the changes that are staged um, have the function as very small integer. But if I call git diff, git diff tells me that I've changed that to very large integer. And if I were to add that again, dummy, we can see that that has been fixed as well. So for changes um, that you don't want to undo completely, you can just overwrite the things that are in the staging area as well. But to be frankly honest, I couldn't think of something um, to show you the git restore staged um, command with a perfectly sane example. So um, let's just quickly do it again. Um, if you want to overwrite it, you can just simply overwrite it. But if there is some case in which you have um, added something to the staging area, which you don't want um, to commit, you can do git restore dash, dash capital S with the file. And that file will be then in will only be in your work tree again. Okay, but let's actually um, remove that completely because that's a function we're not going to use anyway. So we can call git restore dash capital W or dash dash work tree with the file and then it's gone. So I have not yet committed this file as, uh, or the dummy file. So all of the changes that I've introduced are gone. They are not recoverable. So Whenever you use git restore with the dash dash work tree option, keep in mind that that will actually overwrite things on your computer. And for the sake of <coughs> uh, in order to be complete, I'm going to add some nonsense text here. Um, you can also combine these. So we have ended up with dummy being in the staging area and we can restore with dash s dash capital W dummy and that has both restored <coughs> the staging area and the work tree area or the working tree. Okay. Um, so that covers when you have accidentally added something to the staging area. But what if you have forgotten to add something to the staging area that could happen as well? Like you have added some new feature which was implemented in a new file and you've actually added that file, but you forgot to add a reference, like for example, including a header file in some other file and you think that that should be in there. For that, you can use the git commit dash dash amend option. Um, git commit dash dash amend will grab your last commit. It will take the things that are, have been in the staging area when you committed your last commit. It's going to add all of the things that are currently in your staging area and it will open up your editor with the commit message that you have passed. So that comes in handy for two use cases. First and foremost, fixing typos in the commit message. So for example, if yeah, fixing typos, I, don't give, I need to give you an example for that, I guess. Um, but the other important use case is if you've forgotten to add files. So the use case that I've just, um, uh, that I just gave you would be, uh, you could fix that with these three commands. So you git commit, then you think, oh, I've forgotten to add that file. You git add that file, and then you git commit dash dash amend. You can probably then just leave the commit message as it is. 
save and quit, and then you have fixed your commit. <clears throat> but git commit amend will only let you add files. So there's no way to get a, a file and remove it from the commit. For that, you need to actually reset the whole commit and remove the file from the staging area and then recommit. So how do you do that? For that, we use git reset. So git reset um, comes uh, with the three different flavors, um, soft, mixed, and hard. Mixed is the default. Um, git reset is going to take one of these options and reset your most recent commit to that commit that you pass it to, or that you pass it. Most of the time, you're going to just pass it your very last commit. There's a syntax for that, which we're going to cover. Then you can fiddle around with the commit, maybe change some files or add some files, remove some files, whatever. Um, type in your commit message again, and then git commit. <clears throat> but let's go through, through the different flavors that it comes in. So dash dash soft is basically undoing all commits back until the commit that you pass, and it keeps all files staged. <clears throat> so for example, uh, if you have one file where you had, need to actually change something, but you have committed a plethora of files, I don't know, complete directory and some other header files and whatever. You can then just git reset dash dash soft, um, pass in uh, the commit before head and make a change or you can then restore that one file that you need to change, make the changes, um, add that file again and then git commit. But what that, what git reset dash dash soft is doing is basically discarding your git commit. Git commit um, with the dash dash mixed, which is the default option, is going to undo the git commit and the git add. <clears throat> so it's basically undoing commits and it's also unstaging all of your files. And if you really, really want to get rid of some commits because you think the work that has been done within these commits is rubbish, you pass git reset the dash dash hard option and git is going to reset um, to the commit that you pass and it's going to undo all of that work that had hap has happened in there. So with the soft mixed and hard option, you can basically um, draw an analogy to the dash dash staged option and the dash dash work tree option that we have git with that we have had with git restore, just that git reset also undoes all of the commits that you uh, that are referenced. But quick side note to git reset hard, as I've said, git is not deliberately removing any of the object files that we have seen with git cat file. So whenever you undo commits, there is a way to actually get them back because the reference to all of these commits still exists. So as long as you don't deliberately go into your object folders, pick out all of the commits that you have undone and remove those, we're perfectly fine with using the git reset dash dash hard option because there is actually a way to, do, to uh, undo that, which we're going to cover tomorrow. <clears throat> okay. Um, so let's quickly see those in action. Um, and we are going to see um, some other Git uh, related syntax here. So let's take a look at our Git log. Um, <clears throat> our Git log currently has these four um, commits in it. And I'm not quite sure, I don't remember what I've done in my last commit. So I want to git show it. So let's git show f2 c9. We can see, okay, last thing um, 
that I've done was the change about the standard end line. I mean, I could have gotten that from the um, from the commit message, but in order to show you what git show um, does, I wanted to include that as well. So git show will actually show you what differences a certain commit has introduced. And as you can see here, um, our head file currently points to that exact commit. So we can also just git show head and that shows me the exact same thing. So if whenever you want to reference to your most recent commit, your most recent commit will always be referenced with the head file. And git is also, um, git can also do some, some arithmetic, arithmetic for you. Um, so perhaps we want to undo that last commit because we don't want a standard end line in there, but a new line character. In order to do that, we can git reset with the dash dash soft option, and we're going to give it head with a tilde. So the tilde basically says minus, minus one, and that will undo our last commit. But you can also just omit the one as long as you just want to reset one commit. So let's take a look at git log again. Git log has now only these three commits. So we have undone our, our last commit, but let's take a look at git status and at git diff dash dash staged in order to be completely verbose, we can see, okay, perfect. Our dummy file is still staged and it's staged with the exact um, changes that I've introduced in our last commit. So soft has just undone my git commit and I could just git commit again. And since the commit is now, has been undone, git will not store like we have seen with git commit event, it will not um, uh, store the commit message. So we have to put in something in there again. App name should print new line. Okay, so now we're back at having four commits and our master is, uh, our head is again at app name should print new line. But we've said that we want that we actually want to change that from a standard end line to a new line character. So we're going to reset it. And since I actually want to introduce some changes, I'm going to pass the dash dash mix option. And I'm going to give um, pass head with a tilde. So Git tells me that there are some unstaged changes after reset. Let's confirm that. Git status tells me, okay. You have a modified file. We can take a look at it and our modification is still there, but we actually want to remove it and add a new line character. So now we can add it again and git commit app name should be followed by new line. And now we have our commit again. Okay, um, just for just to showing you that again, that as well. Um, we're now going to reset it with the hard option, and now Git tells me that our head has been reversed back to the commit before the most recent commit, and our working tree is clean since hard has also. Uh, undone all of the changes that we have added. Okay. <clears throat> in addition to that, in addition to the possibility that you commit something what you don't want to commit, could be the case that um, you have accidentally added like a file with credentials or the whole log folder of your uh, project, which you obviously don't want to commit because it's just going to be a lot of bloat and unnecessary information. And um, there's also a way to untrack files. <clears throat> and um, 
to top things off, you can then also tell Git to completely ignore these files. So let's take a look at how we would do that. We can go ahead and say git our uh, let's clear that. Take a look at git status. We can git rm dash dash cached with our dummy file. And git now tells me it has removed the file. So let's take a look at the status. And now in, uh, in difference to git always telling us that something has been modified, git will also take notice of things that have been deleted. So if I were to actually remove the dummy file, now it's really gone. Git keeps track of the deletion of the file as well. So in order to put that into context, we have seen that you add files, Git will keep a history of all of these files, not only of the changes, but it will keep each and every single version in its object folder. Git will obviously also check deletions. So if we were to commit that now, Git tells me that there are changes to be committed, namely, we have deleted the dummy.cpp. So deleted unused source code. I'm going to save and quit that. And our working tree is clean. Everything's gone. <coughs> and git show head will even tell me that all of these lines are gone. Okay. <clears throat> In order to um, tell Git that it should not track these files in the future, um, we need to create a file called git ignore. <clears throat> which I have here. Um, if you want to permanently ignore a file, you create a dot git ignore and you echo file names into that git ignore because um, everything that is listed within that git ignore Git will completely, yeah, well, ignore whenever you want to add that file. So <clears throat> whenever a file matches um, a line within that git ignore, you won't be able to add it. And that most often will be used in order uh, with some regex, where you can uh, just give it a wildcard symbol, which is the asterisk. And if you type, if you put in asterisk dot Log, for example, each and every file within your repository that ends with .log will not be included in any of, of the commits. So let's actually put an asterisk.log in here. Now, since the git ignore needs to be tracked as well, we're going to add the git ignore and commit it. Edit git ignore. Edit dot log to git ignore. If we were to touch uh, what today dot log, git status will now tell me that there is nothing to commit. Our working tree is clean, even even apart from that uh, a log file being here. So there's something within our repository. But Git knows it should ignore that, so it's perfectly happy with ignoring it. <clears throat> okay, uh, that brings me to the end of our first stream. Um, what we have covered today is what does Git look internally? So, um, what are blobs? What is a commit? Um, what does a commit consist of? Um, how do you add files? Um, things that you have newly created in your project. Um, how can you add such things to a commit? How can you add changes to a commit? But we have also covered how you can undo commits, how you can restore things um, to not put it into a commit, how you can completely erase your work, which could be necessary as well, and uh, how you view your history. Your history so far on in your git project 
So that is um, covering most of the important parts um, of uh, the work that you do on your local machine. And tomorrow we're going to take a look at how you work on different branches. So today we have only used our master branch. So git branch is a new command we have not seen so far. Git branch tells you all of the branches that you have on your local machine here. <clears throat> tomorrow we're going to take a look at how you can create new branches, how you work with branches, how you merge changes on branches together, how you pick certain things from another branch and so on and so forth. And we're going to top things off with taking a look at how Git handles, um, handles Git push and pulls. So we're going to take a look what a remote is and what branches on a remote servers are, server are. Okay, and as promised, I've got a summary here for you. So I'm going to leave that, uh, that slide open. Um, and I ask you, um, uh, first and foremost, thanks for joining, even though I couldn't see you, which is a pity. But um, I'm going to be here for like another minute or so. If you have no, uh, if you have some questions, please put them into the stream. Um, if some other questions come up um, afterwards, feel free to just email me. I'm going to put the email in the description of that stream after I'm done. Thanks. Okay. Um, the difference between Git, GitLab, and GitHub. Okay. Um, Git is is a software which you have on your uh, on your local machine. So we can call git git um, git dash dash version. <clears throat> so I currently have git in the version 2.27 on my machine. And git um, comes um, with, I think, almost every um, Unix distribution. I'm not sure whether it comes with, um, with uh, can, comes already um, pre-installed with, with Max. For Windows, I know that you need to install it. Um, but Git is just a command line utility for you and your local machine. GitLab and GitHub, um, in, in contrast to that, um, are web applications. So GitHub is a web application which is hosted on, on some servers, uh, which in the background does all of it, it, it handles all of that pushing, pulling. So if you connect yourself to GitHub and you push to some uh, project repository that you have hosted on GitHub, you're using Git. Um, but GitHub is then doing lots and lots of other things with the thing with your commits, for example. So GitHub is providing you, for example, with um, an overview of the files that you have pushed. And it's very neatly rendering uh, as soon as you uh, add a readme.md file. So for example, if I were to add a readme.md, hello, this is our lecture repo, and I save and quit that, Git now knows about that readme file, or it's, currently it's untracked, but I can add and commit it. Um, Git will not care about what that readme file is. But the people who are developing GitHub have implemented a functionality which takes the readme file and neatly displays it on a, on a web server. Apart from that, um, GitHub also gives you the possibility to open up issues. I don't know if you've used that so far, um, <clears throat> but for example, if you are using some source code, uh, sorry, some open source app where you find, uh, where, where you think that there's an issue or it lacks some functionality that you'd like it to have, you can go to um, the maintainer's GitHub repository and post an issue there. Or if you have added some code and you want to, and you think that the functionality that you have 
is really, really cool. You can push it to GitHub and then open up a pull request so that the maintainer of the project is going to take a look at that. So all of that um, rendering of your source code files, rendering of the readme file, um, giving you an issue tracker, pull requests, and so on and so forth, that's all part of GitHub. That has nothing to do with Git on its own. So Git is just the version controlling and the communication between server and your client. GitHub, on the other hand, has gives you possibility for um, maintaining projects, I think, like project labels like Trello, um, and the issues and pull requests and so forth and so forth. So Git backend, GitHub front end with all the visualization, basically. Um, which editor do you recommend for Git? Um, <clears throat> I use Vim. I use Vim for everything. I actually use um, Vim for source code development as well. So I'm not using an IDE. That's why you've seen me editing the source code files um, in Vim as well. Um, I guess if you're using an IDE, um, I'm deliberately not covering that because if I were to start um, with covering Git in the context of some IDE, um, like 70, 80, 90% of viewers who are not using that IDE are going to be upset because I'm not covering things that their IDE is capable of. So that's why we're just looking at Git at the very bare thing, namely in the terminal. Um, but coming back to your question, I hope that if you're using an IDE, your IDE is handling everything. Like if you're committing something, you should be able to um, enter your commit message via your IDE. Um, if that's not the case, um, I would use Vim. But I'm only recommending that because I'm a Vim user. Um, I think as a standard, it's picking the standard um, editor that you have on your machine. And I guess for Ubuntu, this is Nano, I think, or yeah, I think it's Nano. Um, but I think it's gitvar, no, sorry, gitvar-l. Um, <clears throat> with gitvar-l, um, Git will give you all of um, the variables that you have set. And as you can see here, you can override an environment variable within your terminal called git editor, and git will then use that editor exactly. Okay, uh, are there some other questions? I actually don't have any idea how the latency with YouTube is, so I have no idea how long it takes you to hear what I'm saying. So I'm going to, yeah, um, git ignore. Um, yes, of course. Um, in order to understand what, uh, how git ignore is working, we would actually need to go into a bit of a detail about uh, um, regular expressions. Um, but basically what the git ignore file is about is, um, okay, perfect, thanks. Um, <clears throat> the git ignore file is going to be a list of regular expressions, basically. Um, what are regular expressions? Um, let's take a look at what we have here. Um, uh, a regular expression is just some string where you can put in some fancy operators, basically. And what you're mostly going to use with the git ignore is asterisks, like we have it here, the asterisks, and then followed with some extension. Or if you, for example, want to um, ignore the whole log folder, you're going to put in log slash and then asterisk. So everything that's within a log folder will be completely ignored by Git. So Git, before you're um, calling Git status, for example, 
Git is going to check whether um, any of these files listed um, matches any of these um, strings in here in git ignore. And when a file matches it, it's not going to uh, show it in, in, in the git status. So it's a handy way for you to tell git to ignore certain files. But bear in mind, if you have already added that file it's, and, and committed it, it's still popping up um, in your commits, obviously, because it's already in some commit. And if you, for example, add a file with credentials and commit it, um, and you commit it to a server, for example, it's very hard, nearly impossible to get that um, to, to remove it again. You would need some, some of the uh, uh, plumbing commands to do that. Filter branch, to be exactly. Uh, to, be, uh, to list that. Uh. To summarize, git ignore helps you with ignoring files, basically. Okay, um, can I just not put the files into the staging phase? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, I mean, if I were to remove everything from the git ignore, so everything's gone, and we call git status again, um, the log is now popping up as an untracked file. But you probably, or like you are, never going to want to um, add a log file or i don't know credential file or uh, some binary files like pdfs for example you're never going to want to add that to a git repository because it's just bloating things up and the log file might not be that interesting to keep in a source uh, code directory um so yes you can just not add it but if it's bothering you um, down there as in, in the list of the untracked files, put it into the git ignore and git, you never really run into the issue of accidentally adding it. Um, let me switch here. Um, actually, I forgot to mention that. Thanks for putting that out. Um, the stream is being recorded and I expect YouTube to do that actually. Um, all streams that I've hosted so far <laughs> have ended up on YouTube uh, via the same link. So you can just re-watch uh, that video under the exact same link. And um, as you can see here on, uh, on my background picture, I have listed an URL. I can, I'm going to put that URL into the description of that stream as well. So um, in one of my GitHub repositories, you can just download the PDFs. <clears throat> and just a disclaimer the versions that are on that repository are from last year's course so i think i've committed them with final version 2019 or so um they are going to be updated as soon as we're done with the uh, with the whole course okay um if you have some questions um, after the um, uh, end of the stream, just feel free, once again, to just write me an email. Or if you have a topic which you want me to cover uh, in tomorrow's stream or the day after tomorrow's stream, um, feel free to write me an email as well. <clears throat> um, then I'm going to add it in, 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 into my to-do for the next streams. Um, but other than that, um, thanks for joining. Um, and I hope that I'm going to <laughs> see you in the stream um, tomorrow again. Uh, bye.